My name is Andrew Jantz. Um, I'm a husband and father. My background, as far as my career, was in publishing. That career sort of imploded when I got sick. My name is Kira Van Gelder. I am 36 years old. I started cutting and burning myself pretty regularly when I was 14. Christina Knight, and I'm 27. I sensed that something was going on in my teenage years, especially like my senior year of high school. I knew that something was up, but I, I didn't know what it was, and I kind of tried to avoid it as much as possible. Borderline personality disorder is really a serious illness that we do cur currently now understand as a medical disorder that probably affects about 1% of the population. The criteria for this disorder can be grouped into three subsets, those that have to do with emotional instability, those that have to do with behavioral instability, and those that have to do with interpersonal instability. People with borderline personality experience emotions more intensely. Someone can say something to me and I can have a severe reaction and then two minutes later I can have another completely different severe reaction. And so it's just constantly, it's, I mean, in the course of a day, it's, it's incredibly exhausting. You also find a real pattern of a lot of interpersonal problems. They tend to be, on the one hand, very dependent and clinging, and on the other, rapidly enraged and rejecting. The hardest part for me was when she was acting out in a behavioral way that was really um, angry. You can't have interpersonal relationships if you're not emotionally stable. Uh, it's extremely difficult to deal with someone who hates you one day, likes you the next day, and could love you the third day. I grew up in a bunch of places. I started out um, growing up in Europe uh, until I was about six. My father was in the Air Force, and so it was myself, my mother, and my brother in Holland and Italy. I had a very active imagination. I loved art and was athletic and played a lot. When I graduated from college, publishing seemed a natural way for me to go since I was a bookworm and loved books. And so I got into publishing and um, began to sort of climb the ladder. I had a good job, nice wife, um, had two beautiful children, bought a beautiful Victorian in, in a nice town. I had it all. And I remember one day I was raking leaves in the front yard and you know here I was uh, in my early 30s and people walking by were thinking, God, you know, look at this guy. He's got everything, you know? And I felt, I was conscious of that. Um, I felt fortunate. A lot of people in my life, or just people that I would meet, I'm sure, and I know this, they thought that I had everything together. They thought that everything was perfect because that's how I appeared to the world. I appeared as someone who had everything going for them and that I was under control of everything and that I had all these goals. Really, until she was in her mid-teens, Everything seemed to be very normal. She was a, a, a very involved child with a lot of sports, very uh, good at gymnastics and soccer, and she was very motivated in school. Outwardly, I think people thought I was very um, affable and outgoing and, and uh, personable, and um, I was a, a good manager. Uh, I, I worked well with people. What was happening inside of me was a different story. Um, that began to get worse and worse. One of the things that happened when I was six was uh, my parents had divorced and we had moved from uh, Holland to Massachusetts. We were in this uh, small community and there's just a, basically a street with a lot of people on it. And one of the guys who was uh, babysitting for my brother and I regularly was molesting me at that time and I remember starting to develop a sort of aspect that I was always being watched and it gave me a, a real sense of um, discomfort and anxiety 
when I was around groups, especially if I knew that, that he was going to be there. And I, uh, didn't, I really didn't know how to handle the situation. I just didn't say anything to anyone. And so there's a, that, I think that was really the beginning of, of um, my sort of shift into being more um, socially awkward and more fearful. There was a sense of uh, not really knowing who you are. I mean, I think there had always been sort of a chameleon-like character in me. I was always sort of being who other people wanted me to be or who they expected me to be. And I felt that in the morning, it was almost like I had to sort of zip on my suit and tie, you know, put on this, this persona uh, of, of a you know, confident manager and go into work. And I'd sort of just get through the day. And then afterwards, walking to my car in the garage, it was just like a total deflation. I felt totally depleted. I, like I had given everything I had just to get through the day. And by the time I got home, I had nothing left for my wife and kids. I feel like I don't really have a group that I can identify with. I don't really feel like I fit in with my family. I don't feel like I fit in as a college student. I don't feel like I fit in whenever I work someplace and that's probably because I don't have an idea of who I am. My way of coping was to start journals of how I should have a personality, writing down, like, this is the type of person I should be so that people will like me, and I can therefore be a part of something. You know, and I would study people, and my writing was about observing other people and how those observations could be in one way or another applied to how I should be, because I didn't know how to be. You could actually define borderline personality disorder as the I don't fit in disorder. They are, in my opinion, the ultimate outsiders. They oftentimes try to um, conform to what they think other people want from them. When we got married, he, he pushed himself down a path now he's going to be a husband, a father, a homeowner. He was going to get on a track. Maybe that was what he was supposed to do, and that would make him happy. We went down that track, and it didn't make him happy. And I think that, that engendered a lot of anger inside of me that began to sort of fester. And it began to feel like it was eating me up from the inside, like I was rusting through inside. I remember one time when I was in um, ninth grade, actually, and I had finally made a friend. And this was like a, a friendship where we were spending time together, and I, I was so happy. I mean, it really, and, to, and my, my relationships with people tended to be so intense, and I didn't really know how to kind of just have casual friendships. I was like, you know, you're my best friend forever and ever, you know, and, and probably the six months, eight months of our friendship, this young woman lost a lot of weight and went through this transformation. You know, her sort of moving up the social ladder and hanging out with the kids who were cooler and prettier and whatever. And when she did that, I found that I was unable to accept what she had done. I ended up sending her a letter written in my blood. Writing a letter in your own blood is a beautiful example of communication of a desperate need, which would be very difficult for the other person to ignore. This is a group of people who often need other people to regulate them. The relationships that they form are often breathe life into them. And therefore, if the people who are regulating them in some way are getting ready to leave them, it can feel like a life and death proposition. Absences or separations from those relationships once they're established are catastrophic in their significance. Like I don't exist myself. I'm not sure that people with borderline personality disorder know that they're being manipulative but it comes across that way often to the people who are living with them or who are around them. Sometimes for the family members, it's almost like walking on eggshells. 
Sometimes living your life in what you think is a normal way is upsetting to them, so you stop doing that, and then you feel like that was their purpose all along. People see the emotional sort of, uh, I think there's a phrase, you know, I, um, I hate you, don't ever leave me. People tend to see it not as a medical condition, but as just somebody being difficult, dramatic, self-absorbed. And these were all things that people should be able to control um, because it's not an illness. Manipulation assumes that a person has the skills to, in, to, 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 to think about and then execute a plan. And manipulation in that sense, I don't think can be applied to people with BPD because it's all about knee-jerk reactions and desperately trying to get something to feel secure and safe and okay again. And so for me, um, you know, when I was sending letters of blood to people, written in blood, one could say that was a tad manipulative. On the other hand, you could just as easily say, I had no clue about what I was doing. I had no idea how to get people to pay attention to me in ways that would work. Manipulation is when you consciously try to get someone to do something for you without them knowing that you actually got them to do it. These individuals very rarely have the end of personal skills to figure out how to get you to do things in an unobtrusive way. I began to lose a sense of connection with my wife and kids, it was becoming less and less engaged with them, withdrawing from them, very irritable, um, anger percolating. At it surfacing at inappropriate times. I can remember him having a conversation with my sister on the phone that for some reason something she said just put him over the edge. He slammed down the phone and broke the glass coffee table because he slammed down the phone that hard and I was like, oh my God. Another time I remember practically, uh, I, mean, I was trying to get dressed for work and uh, it was something minor was uh, getting me angry and something like uh, trying to take my suit off a hanger and it got caught. And I just began to sort of start ripping, you know, and, and uh, slamming the closet door, things like that. Um, physical aggression that was coming out, not against anybody, but um, just things. This is a group of people who emotionally respond much more sensitively to things. In other words, they respond to some small thing when for you it might take something big. So that's just an emotional vulnerability factor. The second thing you have to know about them is not only do they respond to a very small event, they respond very rapidly. You know, they say that borderlines can feel like burn victims, that if that their skin is just raw, like someone who's been burned, and that if something is said to them or, or done to them, that they feel it with the intensity that you would if you poked somebody in the arm that didn't have skin on their arm. It's really easy for me to get out of control. And it takes a while for me to be able to calm myself down. There was a specific instance. Um, I went up to the street vendor, and he had these markers. And he had the markers spread out all over the table. And there was paper there. I should be able to use the markers and draw on the paper to see what the markers did. But he didn't want me to touch the markers. I lost my mind, like, I to the point where my boyfriend at the time was like, we need, we need to leave. Like, he had to drag me away from there because I was so upset and could not understand why he would have the markers and the paper out on the table if he didn't want people to touch them. And he just didn't want me to touch them. I think that it was embarrassing to the person that she was with. And she doesn't seem to understand at the time that it's over the top and, and an incident that didn't need to escalate to that degree. I got so heated about it so quickly that I felt like I didn't have any control over it. And I obsessed about that for days afterwards. And I told the story to like so many different people just to, to justify that I was right in the fact that I should have been able to use the markers. Individuals who meet criteria for borderline personality disorder ordinarily, no matter how hard they try, despite all their very best intentions, simply cannot regulate themselves.
I would make relationships with people based on these um, really sort of, you know, these behaviors that were self-destructive. There was always sort of like the getting high or the, or the doing something dangerous. And then getting, you know, crazy drunk and dancing with people and going out to parties and, and, and having sex with, with people who were very attractive and, and, you know, ephemeral and I would never see them again. Christina tends to have risky behavior, whether it's um, drug use or whether it's driving her car very fast. I know that, like, when I, there are certain people that I've met that haven't been great for me, like, they have been doing drugs or whatever, and I will go to the extent to where I will actually do the drugs just so I fit in with them, and that's not necessarily the greatest thing. She also has um, eating difficulties, and, and so she's been bulimic, and I think that that's a risky behavior that could, you know, ultimately be life-threatening. That constant level of intense distraction and chaos is a way to distract from all of the painful things that are going on. A lot of the dysfunctional problematic behavior that an individual who meets criteria for borderline engages in, if you look at the behavior, you will see that that behavior, in fact, is highly effective at regulating their emotions. The only big problem with that behavior is it regulates it short term instead of long term. That is the problem. I started cutting when I was 14. I had become infatuated with another student and was rejected. And the rejection, this was like a romantic infatuation, was very public. I was very upset and I went into the bathroom in between classes and I had a tack and I just started dragging the tack along my, my arm. I remember once um, uh, being, feeling very hurt um, by a conversation I had with my father and there was a lot of anger and emotion, and I slammed down the phone, and I went and got a razor blade, and I started cutting my wrist. Anytime that I've cut, it's been because my emotions were so intense that I needed a different outlet for them, and to inflict physical pain on myself was a relief because then I could focus on the physical pain, and I didn't have to focus on the emotional pain that I was feeling. To me, it was like a cigarette break, in a sense, and, um and a way of, of being able to manage the feelings that I hadn't found a way to do yet. There's no doubt about it at all. Cutting and physically damaging the self regulates emotions in this group of people. No one is clear on exactly why it happens, and there's a lot of research on it. The self-destructive behaviors of borderline patients can definitely serve to help them alleviate feeling states that they can't stand, oftentimes feeling states that they can't even articulate. There's a kind of uh, gratification to it as you're cutting and you're seeing the blood come out. There's a satisfaction. And after you do it, you know, I'd make four or five, six cuts on my wrist and see the blood coming out. There was a sense of relief afterwards. I'd, I'd be sort of shaking with excitement, but feeling calm. And the emotional storm I was feeling had sort of subsided. They would come down to me and go, look, and they'd have blood down his arm, and I'd, but he'd have this look like, like he almost felt better now. On the perfectly pragmatic side, the reason it's a bad idea is it means that you never solve the problem that generated an emotion in the first place. So it becomes like taking drugs. It's a way to avoid, distract, or get out of something, but it isn't a way that makes you look at it and figure out how to solve it. Long term, you cannot be a parent, you can't be a successful person, you can't be at work and say, okay, oh yeah, right, I don't solve problems, I cut. Okay, I'll cut. You'll have to leave meetings. You'll have to leave your children somewhere. I mean, how in the world are you gonna live your life if this is how you solve your problems? As I began to feel 
more and more worthless as a person. I began to feel that uh, people would be better off without me because I was just falling apart. It was sort of a burning wreck of a person. So the only way out, as I saw it, was um, suicide. The thing that started happening is I wasn't able to live with what was inside of me and what I was dealing with around me. I felt very powerless. So I started going into my parents' liquor cabinet and drinking from all the bottles. I began to think about it more and more, and it became almost like a little seed that started growing. And suicide um, became more and more of, a, of an infatuation. And all of a sudden, I found myself listening to Nine Inch Nails, um, Smashing Pumpkins, um, Pink Floyd, a lot of real kind of dark, uh, you know, the downward spiral by uh, Nine Inch Nails was basically an album about somebody's self-destruction. And uh, I used to listen to that and it was, you know, it really spoke to me. I was pretty much walking around every day with, with a bottle of, of whiskey in my backpack and razor blades and just drinking as much as I could and then going into the woods and cutting myself and hoping I could actually make the cut that would do it. I began to think about doing it more realistically. And I basically uh, flirted with everything. Every, I would walk up on bridges, highway overpasses, and just look down and think about jumping. Um, I put a loaded shotgun on my mouth. Um, I would stand up on a stool with a noose around my neck. Um, overdosed massively a few times. There was a math test, and you know, seventh grade, and I remember panicking because I couldn't find the math notes. And um, that night before the test, I went into my mother's drawers in her bedroom, and I knew that she had um, pills there. So I ended up taking the bottle of pills, thinking, "Okay, this is this is it. I, you know, I've, I failed." But they obviously weren't enough to do anything. And uh, and you know, and I woke up in the morning and felt disappointed. I used to go to work and I'd look at the subway trains pulling into the station and think about jumping in front of them. I actually did go for a walk in a subway station downtown Boston once, just uh, wrote a suicide note. I was dressed up in my suit, walked out of my office and uh, walked into a tunnel at Park Street Station. <laughs> I, I, I can still recall um, seeing you know, the darkness ahead of me as I was walking in the tunnel and seeing my shadow in front of me growing longer and longer as the subway train came up behind me. And I was just totally detached. I didn't feel afraid. I didn't feel depressed, really. I was just kind of like shut down completely. And um, the train stopped. And I turned around and started walking you know, next to the train to get back out of the tunnel. And when I got out, went to a payphone, called 911, and said, you know, I, I just went for a walk in a subway tunnel. I think I need to, to be put into the hospital. Thinking about suicide or wanting to be dead is extraordinarily common. Suicide attempts are very common. And suicide itself is very common. Uh, between 8 and 10% of people who meet criteria for borderline personality disorder ultimately end up dead by suicide. Borderline patients are deeply ambivalent about whether to live. And if there isn't somebody who affirms their wish to have them alive, they'd just as soon be dead. I had to drop out my second semester. The following year, I tried to go back to school. I got depressed again. I dropped out again, but more severe to the point where I was, you know, had the suicidal ideation. And um, I was just kind of sick of feeling the way that I had been feeling for the past couple of years. And I wanted more of an answer. After getting a GED, going back to school, dropping out of college, going back to college, finishing college, going to graduate school for creative writing. And at that point, I was um, starting to, to teach art and memoir writing. But um, what I was discovering was that um, my ability to function in life was um, really compromised by these reactions I'd have to situations, to relationships, to responsibilities, to stress. She 
went to McLean Hospital uh, after she had gotten her master's degree. And she had climbed out, but she had achieved a, a goal in her life, and then everything fell apart. Everything fell apart. That was when I really saw what could happen to her. I came in with a, a very serious list of complaints, which was that I couldn't keep a job. I couldn't tolerate being in relationships. They were too painful, that my emotional life was out of control. And I, you know, was crying and uh, reacting all over the place. Couldn't drive a car because I couldn't think straight. And I thought people were chasing after me and that I was constantly feeling suicidal. Just my perceptions were very skewed. I didn't, I couldn't see things clearly. I, I, I had no sense of, of who I was. Well, the staff doctor that was treating me came in and told me, you know, I think that you have borderline personality disorder. And I immediately thought that that meant I was on the borderline between like sanity and insanity or something. Um, and he, he said, no, that's not what it is. And he kind of explained to me the criteria. Do you find that um, you, uh fear abandonment and you know we'll, we'll desperately try to to avoid it at all, at all costs and i was like yeah and he said well you know do you do you find that you're really emotionally labile and you you know up and down and change and you're sensitive to the things around you and rejection and i said oh oh my god yeah and, and you know just sort of checked over the there's 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 nine criteria and um you know stormy relationships and when people you know do you idealize people and then when they disappoint you do, do you devalue them and and by the time he got to the ninth one, he's like, and, you know, do you experience paranoia when you're under extreme stress? And I'm like, yeah. <laughs> and everything he said to me was like, oh, I have that, I have that, I have that. So that to me was like, oh, there is something out there that explains this. People with a disorder more commonly than not find it a great relief to be diagnosed. It's like looking in the mirror is a common phrase. It's like, oh, my God, I'm something. And the something is understandable. Somebody could actually understand me. And if they understand me, maybe I could understand me. Maybe other people are like me, which means that I'm not so alone. I am not different from everybody in the world. I'm not an outsider every single place I am. And also, there's an enormous relief that there might be a treatment. Borderline personality disorder is an eminently treatable disorder and um, patients can be helped. And with good therapeutic resources, uh, patients have a good chance to get better. There are many therapies which are appropriate and helpful for borderline patients. There are the individual psychotherapies, there are psychosocial therapies, which include family interventions and group therapies, and there are medications. Psychopharmacological treatment is an auxiliary treatment that is helpful in many cases. We have very few evidence-based treatments for borderline personality disorder at this point. DBT is probably the treatment for which there is the greatest evidence. Dialectical behavior therapy um, was designed very specifically for people who uh, self-harmed and had strong suicidal impulses. It basically is helping you to deal with situations that are gonna come up every day and your emotional reaction is going to be a certain way and it helps you deal with that emotional reaction. It helps you find ways to stabilize yourself. It is the synthesis or merging of trying to change something while simultaneously radically accepting that it is what it is. It encourages, first of all, the person who's suffering to step out and look at their own emotions as a third person might, rather than to immediately act on them. The reason it's called dialectical behavior therapy is because the treatment itself is a synthesis of both the change in behavior therapy and the acceptance, which when the treatment was developed was drawn primarily from my own practice and experience in Zen. 
it used to feel literally like people's eyes would have a physical effect on my body. Like my neck would prickle and my heart would constrict. And I interpret that they are looking at me in a hostile way. You know, the fact is they are looking at me, but I can't assume what they're feeling inside and what they're thinking. DBT has helped me tolerate that I feel this thing and I interpret it this way, but it may not necessarily be the reality. I like dialectical behavioral therapy because there were things that I could work on on a daily basis um, that would help me get through the day. And there were certain exercises that I could do. Um, and there was concrete things that I could do. The last time I, I desperately wanted to cut myself, I did um, a type of technique that I learned through DBT, um, which is I went and I held ice cubes in my hand. And putting ice cubes in your hand when you really want to experience physical pain as a way of focusing on something without necessarily hurting yourself. Instead of saying, oh, I just shouldn't feel this way, or oh, I need to change the way I feel, you learn how to work with what you're experiencing in a effect more effective way. It is so effective that we've had some clients when they knew they were gonna have to discuss something extremely intense like sexual abuse or rape or something like that, actually go to the store and buy those little cubes that you can put in your freezer, the ones that are wrapped up and you can put them in your freezer. And when they have to have a session like that, they take them with them to the therapist's office, hold them in their hands during the session. The other forms of uh, treatment which have been empirically validated include a transference focused psychotherapy, which is a derivative of the early psychoanalytic treatments and focused much more on the importance of interpretation and understanding the ways in which oneself, the borderline patient, distorts their views of other people and of themselves. It tries to bring about an integration of the patient's concept of self and of the patient's concept of significant others. When I got into therapy, I began to open up and to talk about all kinds of things uh, that were bothering me. And, and, um, and one of the things the therapist would try to do is to dissect a particular incident to see if there were triggers that would set that off. And I also participated in group therapy in the hospitals because all the sort of walls came down and the pretenses and all these things that you sort of erect around yourself in the outside world. And people are very uh, open and honest and are willing to talk about very intimate and upsetting things. It's very important for uh, patients or their families who are troubled by borderline personality disorder to find clinicians who are knowledgeable about this and have experience with it and want to treat them. Uh, to seek treatment from people who don't have those qualifications is likely to make the patient worse. The right practitioner and the right treatment are what's required. You can find a really fabulous person who doesn't know treatment or how to treat this particular population. You can find a person who knows an effective treatment who the patient can't relate to. That's not going to work either. You've really got to have both. When I was first diagnosed, I thought that it was basically all my fault and that it was an environmental thing and that I should be able to, you know, fix it myself. And then Later, when I started going to these conferences and learning more about the disease, they came out with studies saying that there are chemical and, and biological reasons for this disease. And so that, to me, was a huge relief because, again, I felt like, oh, there really is a reason for this. It's not just because I am not dealing well with situations. It's not just because I'm not working hard enough to feel better. It's because I have chemical things wrong in my brain. Borderline personality disorder, for sure, has a predisposing biological base. And whether somebody gets the illness depends upon the environment. In that respect, it's not unlike diabetes or high blood pressure within traditional medicine. Take an interaction with another person, for example. We're, we're sitting here talking. I see your face. Well, in the brain, 
there's two pathways. One note directly to the visual cortex that shows me the actual image of your face, so I have a mental picture of it, but also a second pathway that goes to what's called the limbic system, particularly the amygdala, so that I can assess the emotional impact of your face. And these two are integrated in terms of my appraisal of you, and then of course my behavioral response to you. One of the most interesting findings is the finding that the amygdala, the area of the brain that signals danger and fear in borderline personality disorder, seems to be overactive. So that a face that a non-borderline person would react to in a neutral way, a borderline person may actually see as fearful. And when you talk to patients, I think what you hear is they experience other people as angry, critical, and hostile towards them, when indeed, in many instances, that may not be the other person's intent. While the amygdala, the part of the brain that signals danger, is overactive in borderline personality disorder, the prefrontal cortex, the part of the brain that's responsible for higher order thinking, which can inhibit the behavioral response to this alarming signal, seems to be underactive. It doesn't surprise me that people's brains are actually wired differently, that Andy might have kind of an ultra sensitivity to, to things that create, to emotional things too. I think over the past 10 years that as we've come to understand the physical component of mental illness, people have begun more and more to think of it as a real illness, as opposed to just somebody, uh, you know, uh, having emotional problems and they unable to deal with things and, you know, come on, snap out of it, that sort of thing. Although we're just beginning, in a sense, like Columbus leaving the port, we're beginning to understand some of the neural circuits involved in various aspects of this dysregulation. It would be fair to say that BPD can be hell for families. Having a borderline a person with borderline personality disorder as in your family is devastating. There's something in the nature of this condition and in its symptoms that can draw, not only from families, but from trained clinicians, unhelpful responses. From my experience, the most common response of other people who are around people meeting criteria for borderline personality disorder is that their response is shape up. If I had known about BPD at the time of her adolescence, I think I would have been much more attuned to the fact that she reacted very quickly to things that, that were things that she disagreed with. It was a huge, what appeared to us, overreaction and then an inability to regroup. So I think that was a big sign that I, that I missed because I didn't understand what that would have, have to do with mental illness. They know the person's emotional, but they don't know why. And they really don't have the fundamental understanding that the person's actually doing the best they can. It's important for me to get all the emotions out that I'm feeling, because if I don't, then I obsess about them. And I'm, I pick myself apart, and I think about every you know interaction that I had with every person that I interacted with and I can make myself crazy thinking about you know did I do this wrong or you know did that person like me or did they not like me or the real tragedy for the individual is they say I can't regulate it and the other person says yes you can so of course then they start feeling worse about themselves thinking that they can but they just don't want to what really helped me was when I realized that it wasn't about me that I wasn't necessarily what she was angry at and the target of it but that I was just there to be somebody that she could vent all of this feeling that was about something else. So I, I don't know if you remember um, the comedian Gallagher. 
and Gallagher used to uh, smash watermelons and things, and the people in the front row would have to put on um, raincoats or something to cover them up because they'd get splattered with all the watermelon juices. And so I kind of likened myself to being in the front row with Gallagher when he was about to smash the watermelons. She just understands that I need to get it out and that there's nothing wrong with that and that she doesn't have to help me qualify anything. It's just, that's how I feel, I need to get it out and once I get it out, I feel a lot better. We have guidelines for families which suggest that when their uh, borderline offspring or family member has one of these excessively angry reactions, that they listen carefully, look for whatever is true about it, and by validating that part of it which makes sense, it'll calm the person down. To address the part of it which is excessive and inappropriate can and should only be done in a context when the borderline person is themselves calm. You know, when you have a child with this disorder, it's not something you talk about at weddings. That you go out socializing, you often don't talk about these kinds of things. So when family members go to a support group, it's a, an incredible process that happens for them because they feel that someone else understands them and understands what they've gone through. You know, BPD is so much a disorder of, of, of relations, and um, the recovery really involves being able to get back into communities and have relationships and tolerate the distress and, you know, build up a life for yourself again. I found that insurance doesn't want to cover borderline as the initial diagnosis that uh, oftentimes you need to be given a, a different diagnosis, an Axis I diagnosis, such as bipolar, and uh, that will be accepted for insurance. Regrettably, families may have to strengthen themselves to fight insurance companies when they do wrongfully deny coverage for what is indisputably a medical disorder. There's an effort to find brief treatments that will get these patients going. That's an illusion. These patients need long-term treatment. I think it's important for families to recognize that the first no from the insurance company shouldn't be the last word on the subject. The key thing to recognize about borderline personality disorder is you can't decide not to treat it. The insurance companies have to come to grips with this particular reality. The saying we won't pay for the treatment doesn't mean they don't pay for the treatment. They do pay for the treatment. Somebody pays for it. Because when you don't give them treatment, they show up in the emergency room and no one can kick them out of there. And when they get to the emergency room, they often get on an inpatient unit. That's extraordinarily expensive care. When family members call me for the first time, the first thing I want to give them is hope. I want them to know that people with this disorder get better. For somebody whose family member has just recently been diagnosed, I would say that they want to participate in the therapy, get to understand what's going on and what to expect, that they've probably got a long haul. But the more they understand it, the better off they are. Borderline personality disorder is often called the good prognosis diagnosis, and that's because people get better. People recover from this disorder. They manage their lives in effective ways. They have children. They have careers. People with this disorder uh, have a remission, meaning that their psychopathology is greatly reduced within a couple of years. And when that happens, it's sustained. Relapses are not common. The emotionality that they have, the tendency to react quickly, will probably always be there, but you can build a corresponding tendency to be able to regulate. The payoff is that rather than having short series of intense, volatile um, interactions with people, you're probably gonna go through a dry period where it feels like there's no one around, and then things start building. I developed the vocabulary to say to people, 
I get triggered because of this, or I'm having a borderline moment right now, I think you're rejecting me. When you get the diagnosis and a set of language to bring awareness to the interpersonal dynamics, things that used to destroy relationships become opportunities to build a new level of communication. I think the thing that was really helpful to me was to just know that, that I love my daughter more than I need to be right all the time that the relationship is the most important thing to me, that if I can hang in there and learn to understand the perspective of the other person, that it's worth it to hang in there, that we really have a great relationship in spite of a lot of ups and downs. It's also learning that life with a borderline can be a roller coaster ride, and I don't always have to hop on the ride. I think that families should remember that most people with this illness will recover. In some instances, it will take time. And that this really is not a sprint, but a long distance race. There's this like this crucial element that I think is so important, which is the will and the desire to confront what's going on with yourself and believe that if you confront it and you get help for it, things are gonna be so much better. And I can look back now and see that, that I'm much better off today than I was when I was trying to do things on my own. But it takes an awful lot of trust and faith in the people around you to, to admit to having something that's so stigmatized and then to put yourself in their hands and say, please help me.